So yeah, I mean, uh, hi everyone. Um, yeah, happy to be here. Uh, I am here in Japan. It's been a really nice week, and of course, um, just happy to be among so many bioacousticians uh, who are passionate about bioacoustics because uh, I definitely am. And I'm here to talk to you about uh, this open source data creation and annotation tool I've been creating, which I hope can help the community to make, uh, together with deep learning, uh, machine learning approaches can enhance the scale of bioacoustics. So, okay, this talk is gonna be a bit uh, kind of in a light tone. Uh, it's just a Halloween after all, so please bear with my cartoons. Um, so first of all, I'd just like to talk a bit about myself because I think this is important context to the way I think about these problems. So first of all- Santiago, uh, we still know, see the first slide. Oh no. It's okay. Uh, so that's okay. Let me see. Okay. Yes. There we go. Okay. So first of all, um, I'm not a biologist, so please bear with me. And actually, even though I've been working with bats for a while, I'm still very much a novice with bats, but my background is more in mathematics. I did my, uh, bachelor's and master's in maths. And after getting fed up with the abstract uh, world, I went back to Mexico and uh, started working at the Mexican Commission for the Use and Knowledge of Biodiversity, also known as Bonavio. And I was in a team that was uh, mainly focused on this uh, task of doing national scale monitoring. In particular, we were using tools such as uh, audio, or we wanted to use tools such as audio and camera trap images, but also satellite, Im satellite imagery. Um, so from there, uh, I got really in love with the field. Uh, I was especially uh, working with audio. And so I uh, went for a PhD and I'm now a PhD student at University College London under the wonderful supervision of my supervisor, main supervisor, Kate Jones, and uh, secondary supervisor, Oisin McKay. And in my PhD, I am mainly interested in using machine learning to help automate this detection and classification of sound event tasks in a way that's robust and useful for um, ecology, but also biodiversity monitoring and more general bioacoustic tasks. In particular, I am focused on these low data regime uh, situations where you have not a lot of annotated data and mostly using BATS uh, data. So first of all, I would like to give you the story, uh, my story uh, at this government organization in Mexico. Um, so here I'm gonna present the two characters of the story. So there's this like a ideal government official and any similarities to reality is completely a coincidence. And uh, this is me, a very naive uh, person just coming into the field, uh, but with a mathematics background. And of course this, um, there's this big buzz around microphones and it being now easy to buy a lot of them and deploy them across different sites so the idea is, OK, so can we use this technology to do bad population monitoring across Mexico in a way that we can measure trends and how they change through time? Of course, it's a big order. So there was some skepticism for my part. So one of the things I did is okay, consult my biologist friends and ask okay, how you go about doing kind of this, uh, this, this job. And well, the first answer is, do you have enough experts who can identify these bad goals and who are willing to review the data that's incoming so that we know which bats are where. And of course, that's completely unfeasible. There are not so many bat experts in Mexico, even though there are quite a few, but not at the volumes needed for such a national scale program. Uh, and of course, it's really hard to get them. I mean, their time is very valuable, so it would be really a tall order to ask for them to be continuously involved in such a monitoring program. And at this point, uh, people just stare at you and say, oh, you're a mathematician and you know how to use computers. Can you just automate it? And so, of course, uh, uh, do not try to reinvent the wheel. Are there any existing solutions that can uh, automatically identify species? And in the case of Mexico, there are around 150 species. Uh, and some of them are able we, we know that they are able we are able to identify them automatically with some software for North American species, but not for most of them. Um, so uh, as any mathematician maybe naively would tell you, well, now there's this boom in data science and machine learning technologies. 
So surely we can develop a solution. The only thing we really need is uh, good amounts or adequate amounts of data. And fortunately, at the moment, there had been a big push towards this uh, goal. So actually, in conjunction with many different bad researchers across Mexico and Conavio, they had organized this wonderful and massive project where they went out and collected all throughout Mexico uh, reference recorders, the recordings of bats, echolocation calls. So they uh, captured bats uh, with myth nets and uh, released them, recorded them. And so we have recordings from 100 sites and uh, over 100, 1,500 individual, yeah, 100 individuals. And of course, that's great. However, you know, as I said before, Mexico is huge. There's more than 140 species of bats. And uh, there are a lot of very different like, environments. And so I started like thinking, oh yeah, can we really do this? Is, there, is this enough data? And well, the government officials just saw me again with their eyes and said, oh, but yeah, we have deep learning. So I guess like overall, <laughs> the discussion at uh, Conario can be summarized in this uh, meme. So, uh, so bad identification is really hard. Uh, and the idea is we have deep learning. So deep learning will just save us from everything, but can it really? So it kind of presents several uh, key questions. So first of all, how far can deep learning really take us towards this idea of having a national wide scale monitoring program for bats? Secondly, what are some of the challenges in the way? And thirdly, what does it not save us from? So first of all, I'm just gonna analyze a bit deeper this idea of deep learning as a magic wand for automation. So first of all, uh, let me just go back and think about how has bioacoustic research been conducted in the previous years? or let's say in previous decades. Um, so most of the time, uh, bioacoustic research is conducted through multiple devices, but that are not uh, like placed in massive uh, scale, spatial scales. Uh, so also like in experimental settings, you would record with some recordings, but not for like huge amounts of time. And this scale of uh, analysis has led to wonderful insights into evolution and ecology and behavior of many different organisms. And they can still continue and will continue forever to be very helpful uh, keys towards, uh, no, uh, for research, for bioacoustic research. However, um, yeah, like this revolution in technologies such as storage and microphone, them getting cheaper has made our government officials saying, oh, okay, now then we can like extend this scale of by acoustic research towards, for example, now let's place recording arrays or even put recordings at a national or global scale and not only record for a few weeks time, but maybe let's record for a whole season, three months worth of data, or even let's make it long-term. Uh, and so in terms of technology, it seems that it is possible to scale up to this uh, kind of wide arrays of uh, by acoustic research. And that's why I guess uh, this chap here thought that biodiversity monitoring, which lives in this kind of long-term national or global scale uh, uh, scales, um, would be possible. But of course, we all know that as you increase the scale of your uh, data collection, um, you have growing in amounts of data. And even if you have huge amounts of human resources to review the data, at some point it just becomes unmanageable and some sort of automation is a necessity. So, okay, we have uh, made the first point, which is automation is really a necessity in case we want to make this kind of uh, national scale monitoring system. So how do we do automation? So in, in the first place, how does one identify, for example, bats? Well, you have this expert who has collected lots of field expertise and also has uh, spent years studying the literature, understanding what are the different characteristics of, of bats' uh, vocalizations. And so all of this uh, accumulated experience can lead to uh, humans being able to identify bat species within recordings. So one of the traditional ways of automating this is grab all these human expertise and encode it somehow in this algorithm that can replicate the human expertise in order to do it automatically. However, all of these solutions um, 
have challenges. First of all, human expertise is really hard to generate in the sense that, of course, it takes years of field experience and understanding the field to be able to uh, really understand the nuances of uh, animal vocalizations. Also, there's this issue that maybe uh, human experience can be biased, and these biases in turn can leak into the algorithm design. Uh, of course, it's incomplete in the sense that not all, of, all organisms are uh, studied. And of course, I guess like a very small proportion of all organisms are studied and understood. And finally, there's a, a bit more important one, which is this human expertise and experience is really hard to express into an algorithm that is also kind of robust. Um, so the data, big data and machine learning revolution in some sense uh, has this um, proposal that human expertise can be um, not completely replaced, but can be augmented with machine expertise. So in the same way as human experience or humans gain expertise by experience, machines can gain expertise by being exposed to data and together with fancy algorithms for automated learning. And in particular, like we've seen the deep learning revolution in the past decade, and these uh, new models are have shown the ability to really perform in a manner we didn't expect in similar contexts where you have like this very highly dimensional data, uh, lots of expertise, human expertise, but it's really hard to express in algorithms, and they perform much better than both humans and other previous approaches. So I guess deep learning. Uh, seems to be a good approach when you're trying to automate. So if you want to build this monitoring program, you need to automate. Deep learning seems to be the best solution. So of course, deep learning is all you really need. So are you convinced? Can we just continue doing deep learning? Yeah, but how do we really know that these automated solutions are working? And not only deep learning solutions, any automated solutions. So for example, some kind of simple uh, Simple solutions such as some statistic models, such as linear regression and stuff, have theoretical uh, tools in order to understand what's the performance of the model when you have out of sample examples. But uh, these complex models, such as deep learning, do not. And most of the time, it's just an empirical evaluation where you test your model, your trained model, on unseen uh, known examples where you know the solution to the examples and you have this test and you can test the performance of the model. Um, so, okay, but how do we know that we really translate to all unseen recordings? And I guess this really depends on the use case of your model. But let me like just define this concept, which is the spo exposure space, which is all of the possible recordings to which you're going in which you're going to use your automated solution. So, Okay, in most of the cases, this exposure space is huge and you have some subsample or some sample of it, which are the test examples. And you're hoping that uh, this evaluation will tell you about the performance across all of these exposure space. However, you know, data in particular, this bioacoustic data is not really simple. Uh, so we're working, when I'm talking about data, I'm actually talking about these audio files that are captured by devices. And ideally, most of the times, you're targeting a specific organism. So you're targeting some specific type of sound. But the audio will also contain other types of sound. Uh, and both the occurrence and frequency of this target and other sounds are modulated or influenced by the recording context. And in some experimental situation, this recording context can be fixed by the experimentalist. But in the case of biodiversity monitoring, this recording context is very uh, variable and uh, unpredictable. And also all of these are influenced in term, uh, by the device you're using to capture the audio and also the methodology. So for example, the height at which you put the recording device or the orientation, stuff like this. So uh, what does this mean for our evaluation discussion? So what if the data, test data we have is not representative? So for example, what about if our exposure space, which are all the possible recordings we want to use uh, our method in, it can be broken down into multiple contexts. And actually, our test examples only cover a few of them. So our evaluation will not be able to tell us anything about the performance of our models in this other context. 
Um, so what is the solution in this case, uh, in which we know that the exposure, uh, exposure space is bigger? Well, of course, uh, we just need to go out and collect more data. And at this point, uh, the government official is just uh, breaks down and says, now what, collect my data? And I reply, well, yeah, I mean, we need to collect more data. And also, we need to collect, collect even more data because these deep learning models are really hard to train. And they actually require lots of data for them to get good performance. And OK, so what kind of data do we really need? Um, so again, as a non-field biologist, I say, well, that's really easy. Just go out to the field, collect data, make sure you know the species get multiple experts to annotate the audio. And uh, so what is this annotation? Well, it's the process in which after recording, you have to go and actually review the recording to see which are the sounds that you're really interested in and mark them and locate them within the whole recording. So this is an example where you see a spectrum that contains actually multiple sounds. And you need to select all of the sounds that are relevant to you and also provide some additional information about their meaning. So in this case, just the species uh, that was the emitter of these calls. Um, and also, what about having multiple experts? Well, since we are doing this em empirical approach where we're testing the model performance towards these known examples, and the known examples are created by human experts, then basically we're just defining truth uh, as human opinion. And so if you have multiple opinions, then you have better uh, claim for objectivity. And also just more people just help to identify errors, create consensus in really hard uh, or ambiguous cases. And of course, different human experts are going to have different expertise, so you're going to have better coverage. Uh, so at this point, the government official basically just gives up and said, OK, can we just use the existing data? Maybe someone else has some data and we just can't collect it from them. And uh, my reply to them, it would be, yeah, of course, this should be done. It's an important key part of the whole project, but it's not the only thing we need to do. In many cases, such as biodiversity monitoring, all of the existing data, even the ones that have not, has not been annotated, is such a tiny fraction of all the exposure space. So consider, for example, all of the species that have never been recorded, all of the situations that have never been recorded, and so um, the current panorama is this, like we have such a tiny fraction of, of all the exposure space if we want to use it for biodiversity or like passive acoustic monitoring. Um, then another situation that commonly arises, is what if you need to adapt some existing solution to your data? And the existing solution was evaluated in data that has nothing to do or has little to do with your own data. Such is the case, as, sorry, when you are, um, for example, reusing one pre-trained network on your own data, well, in this case, you have to make sure that uh, you have to do some sort of evaluation to make sure that the performance that was reported somehow reflects the performance on your data and you can trust the predictions. And finally, and very importantly as well, like this exposure space can change through time. So what we can hear now at a certain site might, might change to, to changes in human activity at the site, land use change, for example, or climate change, or many other things. So actually, this kind of exposure space can drift through time. And even if you had some reliable evaluation of your model uh, in 2023, then you are not necessarily certain that it will be performing as well in 10 years time. And um, it is especially relevant if you want to monitor trends and to make sure that whatever is changing in your observations is not due to the fact that the, like the performance is uh, decreasing. So um, annotation is unavoidable. And actually, data annotation is a long-term commitment for this type of projects where you want to have long-term monitoring. And model performance needs to be monitored, especially in these situations where recording context change. And so far, the only way we really know how to do this is through annotation. Otherwise, uh, any inference we make with the resulting data might be um, or is going to be tainted by this uncertainty in the performance of the model. So OK, <clears throat> hopefully, um, I, can, I have convinced you that annotation is 
truly important if we want to scale uh, by acoustics. Uh, so how can we do this efficiently? And I am passionate about software development. So my solution was, of course, like just develop some software tools. And software tools can be really powerful in ways uh, that other solutions cannot. And they can aid, for example, coordination or synchronization of data, keeping track of all everything that has been done and progress. Um, it's a great communication tool. It can lead to fast annotation. It can also help integrate with the whole kind of machine learning training and development pipelines. So we went about, uh, looked around for solutions, so software tools in the existing uh, like ecosystem of uh, bioacoustic software. And there are loads of very great software tools around. And each one has their own particular flavor and particular goal. And we found, for example, tools that help manage large collections of audio, tools that can already produce some uh, detections of particular types of uh, sound events, tools that already uh, can allow for annotation, or some tools that can do like very precise acoustic measurement of the acoustic characteristics of whatever you're studying. However, there's kind of this new niche that's arising with the development of machine learning in which uh, you have to somehow keep these annotations for a while uh, and use them to train machine learning uh, models and then uh, evaluate these machine learning models with the annotations and learn from that process about what data you're missing or some errors in the annotations and then reiterate the process. So the annotation become kind of the central part of this machine learning development. And we didn't find necessarily any of the tools around that fitted this paradigm, especially if we add to the requirement list that they need to be free, open source, user friendly, and also not specified in a particular uh, taxonomic group. Um, and we really, I really want to like specify or um, highlight the fact that these free open source and user friendly and generic uh, requirements are really important if we want to make kind of this ability to annotate uh, something that's uh, available and accessible to all. So having thought about all of these, um, we came about to develop Wombat. And actually, it, like, it was a bit more organic than what I just told you. I was actually uh, working on annotating some batch recordings from the Yucatan Peninsula. And our research group already had some sort of version of an annotation tool that was built in-house with uh, different partners. And in while I was doing the annotation to like, I quickly started messing around with the code, making it so that it would suit my needs, but also thinking about what could be potentially good for me and other colleagues in the future where we'll be doing annotation work in not such a specific context. So after doing lots of work in that, um, we thought that it would be nice to just polish the whole thing and package it as a solution and publish it so that the wider bioacoustic community could use it. So in what follows, I will describe a bit what WOMAT allows, how it's kind of designed, and also how to use it in a very broad, um, uh, so a high level description. I won't go too much into the details. But uh, ideally, Wombat allows for this iterative workflow where you have some data, you import it into your tool, you start managing, adding some sort of uh, metadata that's important for the annotation process, and then manage the whole annotation aspect. But also, like once you have these annotations, these annotations can be helpful for two things. First of all, just as a way to get an uh, understanding of your data set. So just to learn about the different sound events, potentially show a colleague, oh, look, these are the different sounds from this organism or in this context or whatever. Um, but also, uh, you can start reviewing the annotations there and seeing whether there's some errors or maybe potential uh, vagueness in some annotations. But after all of this, the idea is, OK, so now your annotations are good to go. Uh, you export them. and. Elsewhere, not in Wombat, you can go and do about, uh, with your favorite uh, development tool, you can go about and do all these machine learning development for training your models and use that uh, to do inference in your data sets. But ideally, once you do that, you can evaluate your model. And these same evaluations, you can import back to Wombat and uh, start again the whole loop, but with more information about where the model needs more training data. 
or more evaluation data as well. Okay, so it all seems nice. How does it really work? So I'll describe, um, one second, just how much time have I been talking? Okay. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, so how does it work? So Wumba is split into three main components. So ideally these components all have different goals and are kind of tailored toward different kind of users. Although these users can be the same person or a mixed group of persons, but there are uh, three sections that are focused on three different things. So first of all, it's like data collection and data set management. The other one is the annotation part. And finally, the evaluation of these models, uh, machine learning models. So for data set management, the way it works is that usually you just select a folder in your in your computer and uh, Wombat will scan all the web files in it and uh, record some basic metadata. And I additionally, you can also put a name to your data set and a description. And most of the time, we think these data sets as all a collection of recordings that all can stem from the same research project or a field excursion or as some sort of uh, coherent theme. But um, yeah, once you have all this data within uh, Wombat, it's also important, uh, as I remarked before, to record these recording contexts or to keep these recording contexts since it gives such a lot of information about when uh, our evaluation is complete uh, or at least uh, representative. So in the particular case of environmental condition, uh, environmental recordings, actually this kind of recording context can be broken down a little bit more. So for example, we can think about these recording context made of environmental conditions, which by themselves are kind of modulated uh, in part by the dates in which you record and the time in which you record and also the location. And so we've made it in Walmart so that you can record both uh, date, time, location, and also like this kind of device methodology. But additionally, also you can record the environmental conditions in case you know it. So let me show you how it looks. So Wombat offers this tabular familiar uh, view in which you can uh, edit your metadata. So it has columns uh, in which you, well, these are basically just uh, very basic uh, features of the audio, such as the sample rate and the duration. Then here's a bit more about the recording context, such as date, time, and location, which are encoded as latitude, longitude. And finally, there's also like this, uh, uh, column, which uh, is a theme you will see throughout Wombat, in which you can add multiple tags to each recording. And these tags are somehow like freely generated, and each tag consists of a key and a field. So for example, here we have um, these recording being tagged with season rain. So just to specify that it was done during the rainy season, and also it was done in the site Cenote Azul. But it can be whatever you want. And this key value structure is made so that it's easier to organize the different tags. Uh, and once you create a tag, uh, there's many ways that you can easily search for it so that you avoid duplication and just make it easier for reuse. Um, and then there's also this, this note column. And notes are also another thing that you will see across uh, many parts of Wombat. And ideally, these notes are so that people can discuss the content of uh, whatever is being stored in Wombat. So in the case of recording, so for example, you can discuss whether the metadata was wrong or the recording is weird or whatever. And you can actually just, uh, instead of adding a note, add your comment as an issue. So that is just easier to look as uh, metadata issues, helping the data creation aspect. Uh, once you have all the metadata correct, uh, hopefully, uh, you can also just export the data set into a JSON-based format and share it with other people who also have Wombat. Uh, and they can, on them, uh, by themselves, import it into a platform if they have the audio files and uh, start working on that same data set. OK, so yeah, that's the first part. Uh, but Wombat is actually about annotation. And once you have all these data sets recorded in Wombat, you can actually start these annotation projects. And annotation projects, importantly, can be made from recordings in different data sets. So you have one data set of recordings from one site from Yucatan, and the next year you go out and collect another thing and you import it as another data set, but they're bad recordings, then you can create an all encompassing bad annotation project. Um, so 
So what are annotation projects? So annotation projects, importantly, are not made of recordings, actually. They're made of audio clips, which are sections or subsections of recordings. Um, so actually, you can import or you can add multiple clips per recording in, in case you want to, for example, say, I want all one second clips of this recording added to your annotation project. Or you can also use uh, like the whole recording as a single clip. So it gives you freedom about um, what to uh, make your unit of annotation. So each this each clip is converted into an annotation task, and these tasks need to be fully annotated, which means that they need to be fully reviewed by a human and um, be made to comply with the annotation instructions. Uh, so once you have all these clips within your annotation project, you can also start saying, oh, this clip has already been completed, or this one is review, or this one is pending. And in that way, you can start seeing the annotation progress. Okay, but how do you annotate in Wombat? So you will see um, this interface where you're shown the spectrogram. And actually, you have all these tools to explore the spectrogram, move, zoom in, change the spectrogram settings. And the spectrogram actually is computed on the fly, so you can actually change the spectrogram settings. Um, then, importantly, there's a way of annotation which I guess takes a bit less time or it's a bit less uh, manual in which instead of specifying which are the sound events and where they are, you just tag the recording. So that's also possible within Combat. Uh, but ideally, uh, you would go into a spectrogram and highlight where each of the bats, um, not, not bats, sorry. I do want to specify that this is not specifically for bats. It is flexible tool that should be able to handle any sound. Uh, and any organism, uh, but uh, let's keep on the bad theme for Halloween. Um, so yeah, ideally you would go in and uh, mark the location of each bad pulse. Um, and actually sometimes like depending on the organism you're trying to study, you might select a different way of marking it. So here I have a bounding box, but sometimes you just want to like, uh, and indicate the onset of or on, off, onset and offset time. Finally, when you've done like reviewing the whole spectrogram, you can mark it as complete or as something's weird. Or uh, in case, for example, you're reviewing your whole uh, annotation project, someone can say, "Oh, I've seen the pro the uh, the work of someone else, and I um, verify that it's correct." OK, so oh, sorry, I forgot to say one thing. So it might not be visible, uh, but to each annotation, you can also attach any tags you like. So in this case, it has two tags, which uh, the, first of, uh, the first one uh, indicates the species, and the second one indicates that it's an echolocation code. And so in this way, it's a really flexible way of uh, attaching any kind of meaning to uh, each of the sound events. And it can be a behavioral tag, it can be whichever tag you want. Um, OK, so how do you decide what geometry and parameters and tags to use for your annotation uh, for your annotation work? And well, of course, that needs to be decided when you, when you start your annotation project. And so depending on the project goals, well, you will focus on certain sound events. And this will determine the type of acoustic characteristic these sound events have. So then you will start thinking about, OK, so what visualization parameters I might use? or what kind of um, localization detail I want to have. And also, depending on the project goals and the sound events, you might have a different selection of uh, labels or tags to use. So maybe sometimes you just want to specify the family or the order instead of like, going uh, very detailed taxonomic labels. And sorry, species level uh, tags. And all of these will depend, uh, will in the end influence whether your annotations are adequate to your project goals or not. So yeah, the thing is, please do create good instructions for your annotators uh, so that the task is clear. And you can set them so that depending on the project, it's a different annotation. So here you see the dashboard where you can see the progress, it tells you how many tasks are remaining, how many need review, if there are any issues, et cetera. And yeah, all of this sounds good, but uh, we were thinking about doing machine learning development with that. So again, you can export these annotations into a JSON-based format and give it to the machine. And actually, we're currently developing with uh, my colleagues a training framework that can um, use these annotations and output a trained program.
And so that is coming out soon as well. Um, okay, so yeah, I've talked a lot. Are we done with Wombat? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, of course, the whole point about Wombat is that it supports this iterative workflow uh, and this iterative workflow in which data creation annotation gets better and models get better. So here's where evaluation sets come in. So once we have the annotations, we would like to make the best use of them. So with them, you can uh, select different completely annotated clips from different annotation projects and create an evaluation set and use this evaluation set to evaluate predictions. So um, for example, you can combine an evaluation set and imported predictions from the model from, from a model predictions, I'm sorry, uh, and mod, import model predictions and combine them in Wombat into an evaluation. Also, uh, Wombat has this kind of uh, fun or um, what's it called? Yeah, uh, kind of game, game-ish side to it in which uh, you can uh, use the existing evaluation set and put a user to have play this identification game. And through this identification game, you create tons of predictions, which can then be combined with the evaluation set to get an evaluation of uh, the user performance in the identification task. Um, yeah. And so once you have all of these, uh, you get a set of evaluations. And these evaluations can be used to compare performance across different, for example, uh, annotators, in case you want to do that, or even uh, models and annotators or different models. Uh, so you get an evaluation with, uh, which gives you some global metrics of performance. But I think more crucially is that each of the uh, examples that were in the evaluation set gets evaluated. And you can actually explore this set of um, evaluation or evaluated examples. And you can look for where does the model fail? Where does it do good? Combine it with different filters since everything is tagged. You can also combine it with filters. Oh, I want to do, I want to see where it did not perform, but that it was also in the rainy season. And so, in this way, you can quickly explore the failure cases and understand uh, understand where your model fails. So, for example, if your model fails in context A, then you know maybe I need more training examples of context A. Um, okay, so that sounds good. We're able to test performance, but how do we even test trust annotations in the first place? And so Wombat also provides uh, tons of features that allow users to explore the annotations you've already created. So for example, here we have a 3D scatter plot in which you can visualize in 3D space all of the different annotations. Sorry. Uh, and, and each annotation is assigned like three different acoustic characteristics. Very simple, such as duration, bandwidth, or lowest frequency. And you can actually select which uh, uh, characteristic you want to use. But this kind of visualization is really helpful because it helps you quickly identify outliers to the distribution of normal annotations. And these outliers sometimes are rare cases of like weird vocalizations. But we found that many in many cases, it's just uh, annotation that not, does not conform to the annotation instructions. So it is a powerful way to. Uh, review all the annotations you've already made. And also you can like see uh, the corresponding spectrogram. Okay, so I think that's a broad overview of what Wombat can do. It has, of course, other bits and pieces over there, but um, okay, so I guess hopefully you are interested in using it. Uh, so how can you use it? So first of all, Wombat is built with Python. So it's a Python app. And there are currently instructions in the Wombat repository, which is open source at the moment. Uh, and so on how to install it and how to get it running. However, we understand that these uh, instructions might be a bit complex. And uh, at the moment, it's still a bit buggy. Uh, but we definitely want to distribute standalone executables. So that is single files that can just you can just download and click on it and start Wombat. And this should work in all major platforms. So this is Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, and particularly Ubuntu. And so, yeah, uh, how do you use it uh, when you are working with different people? So there are actually two ways to collaborate with Wombat. So first of all, like there's this 
kind of standalone way. So everyone has their own Wombat instance in their own personal computer. And each one has kind of like a copy of the data. So I work on my piece. Uh, I I done, I'm done uh, annotating or uh, curating the data set. And then I export the file and send it to my colleague. And they can import it and review the annotations and stuff like that. So this is one way in which collaboration can happen. And it's a nice way because, first of all, it doesn't require any internet connection. And also, it's kind of like distributed and asynchronous. So that's really nice. But also, uh, one of the benefits of having it being a Python app, and it's like a web-based Python app, is that you can also host Wombat in a uh, like remote server and have different people connect to that remote server and simply sync their own work. So if you have any shared uh, infrastructure, such as a cloud instance or cloud uh, credits, or a lab computer, uh, then you can set up this uh, for uh, collaborative work in a way that's uh, synchronized already. So yeah, I guess, uh, please, uh, this is uh, kind of not completely new, but it's uh, a work in progress still. We're in uh, kind of like a third iteration, and there's always bugs, and there's always work, more work to be done. So I would, um, if you're interested, I would really invite you to help us with the development of this tool. So in the first place, just use it, test it out, uh, use it for your own use case. Um, if there's something that's not working, please, there's the GitHub repository. You can go into the GitHub and uh, create a discussion or uh, an issue uh, saying, oh, this didn't work, or, oh, I wanted to use it in this case. Uh, how would you recommend? Um, also, there's uh, a bit more involved, uh, uh, more work a bit more involved, which is <clears throat> there's documentation that's still not available. I'm just finishing the last pieces, so I will publish that documentation soon. But uh, of course, that documentation will have lots of typos and errors and might not be fully understandable. So if you are willing and happy, uh, please help us improve the documentation. And if you are one of the people who really love uh, working with code and developing code. Of course, you can contribute with code and suggest new features and talk about it. Uh, however, I do warn you, still in development, it's still very buggy. So uh, bear with me. I'm working to get it to the best point as soon as possible. Um, so OK, I think I had some more slides prepared to talk about how what comes next. But I've talked for, I think, almost 50 minutes or 45 minutes. So uh, I don't know, Ben, do you think uh, I should continue or should we just stop here? Well, I was wondering what comes next. Um, <laughs> we can break for questions. And then if that's, uh, if anybody's questions are related to the what comes next part, then um, you can dive in and show us some some slides about that. Um, sure. answer that question. How does that sound? Because I, I want to make sure we have some good time for questions. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, everybody. Does anybody have a question for Santiago about Wombat? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to stop sharing uh, for a little bit. Uh, I'll come back if it's needed. I just want sure. to see who's... Yeah. Um, so let me see the chat. Nice. Lewis has a question. Lewis is at Justin Katz's, Kitsis's lab in University of Pittsburgh. He works on open soundscape and localization tools. Um, let's see. Sorry, just can can, be, like, can I got it. Um, is there good. any way to deal with the fact that annotations are often incomplete? Um, for example, one project annotates just sounds of species X, then another project annotates sound of species Y on a different data set. Is there a way to query all of uh, your data sets so that you get all clips containing species X, all clips definitely not containing species X, all clips that we don't know because species X wasn't annotated? Mm. So uh, I think, well, there are several things you can do in that scenario. So first of all, like, uh, we did create this kind of annotation project concept because within that annotation project concept, the um, 
the meaning of fully annotated makes sense. Otherwise, it's vague and it has no uh, yeah, no meaning. So for uh, like a bad researcher, fully annotated might mean something, but for someone who is a amphibian researcher, it might mean something else. So uh, once you are handling data from different annotation projects, it's important to understand where they come from and what was uh, like the context in which the annotations were created. But um, secondly, all of the data is stored like underneath uh, and the curtains or behind the curtains is stored in a uh, SQL database. So um, there's also Python code. Uh, if you're familiar, if you're um, not familiar, but if you're um, comfortable using Python, so there's Python code so that you can do your own queries on the database. And so you can start doing kind of these complex queries. So I want all the clips that have this tag but are not from this annotation project or do not have this other tag or stuff like that. Um, let's handle the more technical one first. Does it support different file formats? Unfortunately, at the moment, no. Just so wait. <laughs> just wait for it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's actually an, an issue, like the first issue of the one repository is from uh, a colleague in uh, Costa Rica who's also developing uh, annotation software but for mobile devices. And uh, he's. Um, Happy to start the conversation about what it takes to um, support also FLAC audio files. So I guess uh, we have uh, arranged a meeting in a few weeks' time just to talk about it. And we're definitely open making that as extensive as possible. But of course, at this moment you start uh, including more formats, it can get complicated. But yeah, yeah, of course, uh, I think it is very important to have us support as many different types of formats, but I'd be really happy to get some help <laughs> on that. Okay, Imogen is wondering what comes next? What comes next? Okay, so I'll go back to sharing my screen. So unfortunately, I won't say too much about what comes next for Wombat. I will say what comes next for me, if that's okay. Yeah, because Wombat, okay, so for I Wombat- I just see uh, myself, Wombat, there we go. Yeah. Working so now. for Wombat, um, yeah, the idea is I, I will continue to maintain it. We will make sure that the features that are already there work uh, in all scenarios, so of course, there's going to be loads of situations like edge cases that will break the program. So we'll slowly refine that. In terms of new features, I don't think uh, we will work on too many for now. Uh, I guess uh, one of them is expanding uh, the set of uh, audio formats uh, that it supports. But in terms of my own research and going back to the story about uh, doing deep learning, um, I can tell you a bit about what my plans are and what I've been doing a little bit, if uh, that's interesting. So, okay, once you have like kind of this uh, tool that allows you to do annotation in a very flexible manner. So for example, we I said that you can do bounding boxes, you can like select onset and offset times, or you can also like just mark the start time of a, a sound event. And also you can just tag the whole clip, right? So one of the questions we had is, so how should we annotate recordings? And particularly, what if you have very few recordings and making a bit more detailed annotation, maybe it's not such a huge effort. Does that help the machine learning um, uh, models? And so we did some uh, experiments using like these convolutional neural networks for bad identification um, or classification. And we compared like doing the classic <clears throat> way uh, it, uh, these classification pipelines are done, in which basically you input the whole clip, the whole spectrogram clip to the convolutional neural network, and you expect it to classify whether the clip contains some species or not. And then we um, compare that to a modified version in which we also task the neural network to attempt to locate exactly where the bad calls were. 
And um, this was made with different levels of uh, like detail or geometrical details. So we tested out, for example, what if you just select uh, the onset, onset offset, bounding box, and finally there's this like really detailed version where you trace out the bad call. And we saw that in general, uh, having a bit more detail. Okay, so here we have the graph that results. And in general, um, so 0% uh, is, it means that there was no improvement or no change with respect to the usual way of doing it. And then these are the different geometries we tested. And so if it's above 0%, it means that there was an improvement. So I guess the moral of the story is in general, we saw that performance was a bit better um, when you have, especially when you have few recordings. So when you have few recordings, it does pay off to pay a little bit more attention to the annotation you're making. Although we did not see huge amounts of difference between the different geometries. So I guess our recommendation so far, at least for bats, is uh, do bounding box annotation. You do seem to get good performance boost from that. And it's not so laborious as the line stream. Um, so another question is, okay, so yeah, just to give a bit more context. So Wombat was kind of like this, how do we get data? Uh, but my other parts of uh, research is like, how do we use the data to do the machine learning development? And so another thing we've been working with uh, my supervisor is how do you improve these architectures um, to make some, or how do we make some assumptions? No, how we, do we use what we know about the audio and how we, uh, take those assumptions and make better architectures to make uh, to improve the sample efficiency, which means just learn better with fewer examples. And so this is um, the work uh, Oshin and I have been doing with a bad detective tool, uh, in which we actually added this whole like self attention component to these classical CNN networks. But ideally, the thing is, it just takes uh, it allows it to do long term reasoning, so it helps. It uh, uh, adjusts the probability of a species being present based on what it sees on the whole spectrogram. And the spectrogram we chose for input it was like three second context. And this uh, did improve uh, comparing to like the baseline method performance quite a bit. Um, finally, what's next for me, or what I'm really excited about next is think about okay, we're, I'm constantly thinking about uh, working doing these machine learning solutions in situations where you have very few data. And there's a lot of work already in the broader literature about doing transfer learning or other stuff. But for bats in particular, and I think this is common to many bi uh, like ecological collections, we do have lots of data. Of course, it is biased towards like the Northern Hemisphere. hemisphere. There are very few recordings of bats, for example, in Africa, and even less that are labeled. Um, <clears throat> but let's say like we collect all of these bad recordings and what we get is actually like kind of a collection of data sets and each data set comes from different regions. So they're kind of different contexts. So we have this very patchy view of the whole uh, like collection of bad recordings. So one of my things I'm really interested in, my, my project I'm just starting now is uh, to research different like these few shot machine learning methodologies that uh, attempt to have better uh, ways of teaching uh, machines to to uh, identify bats in cases where you have uh, really low data, but making sure it kind of learn from everything else. So our main goal would be to have like this globally adaptable uh, framework for training bat identification tools with very few data. So uh, our explorations would be what is kind of the best method methodology for that. And um, yeah, I think that in combination with continuing with Wombat, oh, yeah, so for this project, sorry, um, we are actually actively looking for collaborators and we want to set up a network of people who have these bad recordings, ideally already annotated, but if not, we will be setting up uh, one of these uh, server instances of Wombat so that we can do annotations of the recordings that are already there. And uh, so, yeah, we, we're looking for collaborators to start this exploration about how can we do these uh, adaptable framework. So, yeah, I think that's what's nice for me. Amazing, Santiago. This is a, a fascinating presentation and makes me think like it was um, great to connect you with Alvaro, who's developing his Euphonia app, but it would be 
I think really valuable to get you and um, Lewis and people from Arbimon and people from the Raven team here, all these people who are working on tools together to create some synergies and learn from each other. So each of these tools has their core competencies, but I'm sure you all have things to learn and um, teach um, to one another. So. Yeah, and I, yeah, definitely. I think more than having a single tool to uh, conquer it all, it's more uh, like a set of tools uh, making our ecosystem, but that's harmonious and that each tool can easily communicate with each other. I think that's a, a way we can make sure that everyone's effort is uh, being exponentiated by the work mm. of others. So it definitely be really uh, happy to start a conversation with other people about it. Okay, well, we'll be meeting again in two weeks' time, and we're excited to welcome Paul Rowe, who is um, one of the, the leaders of eco-acoustics work that's happening in Australia, and he'll be presenting on, I think it's 400 recorders um, across the continent of Australia that's been um, up and running for maybe four or five years. I'm not entirely sure when it started, but we'll we'll learn all about that that project. It's um what they've gained from it so far, challenges they faced. All of that will happen on November 14th at 6 p.m. Um, Eastern Standard Time. So we'll look forward to seeing you then. Santiago, um, have a restful evening in, in Japan and just thanks so much again for that that great presentation. No, thank you so much for, for the invitation. Happy to be here. For sure. See you. See you soon. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone.